as we think about this day, September 11th, when I say that, for many of you, there's a moment locked in your mind. There's a moment where you can remember exactly where you were, exactly what you were doing when you heard for the first time about those planes hitting the towers. When you saw the images of what took place on this day in 2001. So for many of us, that is crystal clear. For a lot of our friends in this room who are under 30, they may have a vague remembrance of it or none at all. They've seen the pictures in history books. They've talked about it probably with their parents. But they don't have a clear recollection of exactly where they were, exactly what they were doing like so many of us have. I can tell you exactly where I was, where I was standing when the news first broke about September 11th. There are these moments in our history, there are these moments in many of our lives that begin to define who we are and how we see the world. They create generations, and they create generational differences. And for us to overcome those generational differences is really be a multi-generational church that leans into the next generation. We've got to have some necessary exchange about this. We've got to have some conversation. We've got to have some listening ears and some open hearts. We've got to lean in with empathy, not apathy. I mean, apathy just tends to frustrate us when we think about generational differences and we just throw our hands in the air and we go, ugh, millennials. They're the ones that everybody picks on, right? Ugh, millennials. We just, we just deal with them with apathy. But if we listen and learn and Invite them to listen and learn as well, not in a lecture format like so many of us do, but instead to engage one another in conversation and learning. Apathy just creates frustration. But, but empathy, well, that leads to change. That leads, that leads to, change. to understanding. And that leads to understanding. We've got incredible possibility. We've got incredible possibility. We'll listen. We'll hear. We'll listen. We'll hear. A generation gap is a what we're really talking gap about. Is what we're really it's a misunderstanding about. based it's on, a misunderstanding based based on, on normative technology, technology of a group of people born in a particular time period. And it feels much larger today because of the rapid advance and adoption of technology. Te technology has, has pushed generations to come and change quicker. And there's more distance between them. There's more things that we feel like we don't understand. Generations are, are based on uh, things that shaped our first two decades of our lives, based on shared music, tragedies, economies, heroes, milestones, technology, television shows, and events. There are some generational differences. All of us could point to them. There's some things that we don't understand about the next generation, but do you know what the gift of this church is? This is an incredible place because there are seven living generations within the life of this church. That's amazing. It's amazing to think about the generations that exist within this church. I, I saw a, a, a thing going around the internet about Queen Elizabeth and, and in her 96 years, the amount of change that took place in the world. When she was born, they didn't have sliced bread. They couldn't even use the phrase, like, that's better than sliced bread, you know? She, she didn't have that. Incredible change has taken place, and there's seven generations within the life of this church, seven generations of experience, seven generations of possibility and potential. Let me, let me just talk you through these really quick, and uh, I'm going to lean on uh, Dr. Tim Elmore, who's got a great book coming out in a couple of months about uh, generations and leading different generations in an organization. I think I've got a chart with, uh, here we go. All right, so the greatest generation, uh, or GI generation, born in 1901 to 1927, all right, and, and, and their values and their thoughts were shaped by the Depression. Uh, these people fought in a world war. They began to rebuild a nation and prosperity. And, and then you've got the, the silent generation or, 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 or the builders. They were born from 1928 to 1945. And, and the builders grew up during the Great Depression and grew up during World War II. So they're incredibly frugal, resourceful, grateful, uh, and, and conservative in their values. And they the, these are the people who, like, when you have Christmas and you take the wrapping paper off, they're like, don't rip it. 
And we, we, we can save that, right? Fold that up, that's good wrapping paper. We'll use that again next year. Then after that, you've got, uh, you've got our, our baby boomers born 1946 to 1964. Uh, lots of those around because there was a boom of babies after World War II. Uh, these kids grew up during a time of expansion and not depression. Uh, the economy during this season swelled, and they began to question everything. They began to think about the world that was around them, and, and they, they, they thought about, about how they could make life better. Their, their thought would be, I deserve better. And then you've got your, uh, your baby busters or your Gen Xers. Uh, this is my generation. I, I represent these folks very well. Uh, this generation was a, a smaller generation uh, because contraception became a very uh, widely adopted thing. It was a bust, not a boom, of people being born. Generation X grew up very jaded. These are our latchkey kids, a term that we don't use anymore. Uh, often they came home and, and both parents were at work and, and they, they, they became very self-reliant. And, and uh, I love the phrase that Elmore uses when he <laughs> talks about Gen X. He goes, Gen X likes to keep it real, which I felt a little bit targeted in that moment. That's, that's one of my favorite phrases. That's one of those things like, we gave you the real world on MTV. You're welcome. Um, if you didn't like that show, you're just not keeping it real. And then the millennials who is, see, seems to be the, the generation that we all want to dump on, we all want to complain about. Millennials, you guys are awesome. I just want to say that, all right? You guys are great. Uh, so millennials who were born from uh, 1983 to uh, around 2000, 1981, 95, depends on kind of who you look at, uh, 83 to 2000, and they, they kind of see the world and possibility. Life is a cafeteria of choices. They were raised by parents who really thought about their safety, Remember that, that day in 2001 really shaped the way that we think about what we do. They think about safety, self-esteem, status. For, for millennials, life was customized, and, and we complain about them being entitled, but uh, entitlement naturally grows when everybody gets a trophy. Well, I'm not saying it's good or bad, and here's, here's the fun thing when we talk about generations, is we can complain about generations, but guess who made them that way? We did. We did that. But after that, you've got Gen Z. Uh, Gen Z, born 1996 to 2010. Uh, a lot of our young people here are, are Gen Z. Uh, they grow up in the wake of three recessions in a time of mass shootings. They've lived through a pandemic political polar polarization, and lots and lots of anxiety. Mental health becomes their top priority. They're coping and hoping that the world is going to get better. And then you've got our, our alphas, born 2011 to 2025, and we're still figuring out what they're going to be like. And the decisions that we make, the way that we live, the way that we parent, the way that we grow them up, is gonna have huge impact in the way that they shape the world to come. So we have incredible responsibility. Seven generations of people within the life of this church. So many differences, but so many opportunities for us to learn and to grow together. Uh, there's this uh, Native American uh, Iroquois have this philosophy where they, they talk about the decisions that they make. And that those decisions that they make today should result in sustainable world seven generations in the future. They make decisions with seven generations in mind. What I think is really incredible about that is that's a biblical value as well. In, in Exodus chapter 34, we hear this uh, from Moses. The Lord passed before him, and, and God proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, our God, is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilt, but instead allowing the iniquity, the choices of the parents upon the children and the children's children, and to the third and fourth generations. Exodus reminds us that seven generations down the road 
are still experiencing the decisions that we make in the here and now, good decisions and bad decisions. And so, as a church, we've got to embrace this reality that we've got seven generations living together in this place and the opportunity that it has to create a stronger church, a better community, and to see more people hear the good news of Jesus, to change generational outcomes. What an opportunity. What potential. 